Okay, this is going to be chapter four, God and money. Reach in your pocket and take out a dollar if you have one. Unfold it and look at it. Look at the front, at the pictures and engraving. Turn it over and look at the curious markings on the back. It is paper engraved with a blending of black and green ink, a high quality bond with tiny threads of red and blue in it. It is just paper and ink. The United States government grinds out 1.6 billion $1 silver certificates each year. Another 5.4 billion notes in fives, tens, and twenties, fifties, and one hundreds are printed every year. Great blankets of green roll over the presses. I should say it like this. Great blankets of green roll over the presses and are cut neatly bound and shipped to reserve banks all over the country. It's another commodity. The same presses could just as easily print bumper stickers, but the presses print money, paper stuff to allow the value of one person's work or product to be converted into a form that can be carried in a pocket and traded for other goods and services he or she needs, even halfway around the world, money. However, something about these engraved pieces of paper can destroy a marriage or cause men and women to sacrifice leisure time with family and friends and even health to get more of them. The innocent paper you're holding has driven young men in the inner city to entice their friends to take killer drugs. It has corrupted the justice of men who started out to give their lives upholding the law. The lust for money has led adults to do unspeakable things to children to make millions in um, uh, using children. The desire for wealth has even caused wars. Somehow money has the terrible ability to gain control of a person's soul. The power of money can bring life or death. Let me tell you two stories. First story. Nearly 20 years ago, a man in Southern California gave $2,000 for a YWAM property to be purchased in the South Pacific nation of Fiji, not far from the airport in Nadi. For years, the property waited there. And finally, in 1983, a team led by Neville Wilson came to pioneer a permanent work in Fiji. We told some of Neville's story in the previous chapter. They began to build on the property, a simple building, much like those lived in by their neighbors in the sugar cane fields. The building has been used for numerous ministries, including the launching of a 24-hour prayer chain to pray for the evangel evangelization of every nation on earth. So far, they have prayed around the clock since January 1, 1989, over 24,000 hours of prayers for such places as Mongolia, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. There has never been much money at the base, but they have high ambitions to affect nations. Eight Fijian missionaries have gone out to nations like India. They want to make a difference in Fiji too, so they have started a preschool to help the poorest of the children on the island. The children of the cane field workers, many of whom are from India. In Indian elementary schools in Fiji, children who do well academically are given the honor of sitting in the front of the class. Those who do poorly have to sit in the back. The locals say a cane field worker's child has never been able to sit in the front of the classroom. For generations, they have done the worst and have sat in the back. Now, th thanks to YWAM's preschool, cane field workers sit in the front. Children, Their children sit in the front, and some of their parents have been converted from Hinduism to faith in Jesus Christ. All of this, children with a new future, parents with a new faith, young missionaries sent out after a three-year-plus prayer meeting for the nations because of a man from California who invested $2,000 in God's work far away in the Fijian Islands. It almost seems as if the money has taken on life, like a seed planted that God has caused to grow. Money is not always given so freely, nor does it always bring life. It can be bring death as well. Let me tell you a second story. Last year, a pillar of orange fire and billows of black smoke poured into the night sky of Austin, Texas, as firemen arrived at a blazing two-story apartment building. While the fire engines wailed to a halt, people dressed in pajamas, underwear, and even bed sheets running from the building. A young firefighter looked up in horror as an obviously pregnant girl stood screaming inside a second-story window. Then responding to urgent cries in Spanish from a young man already on the ground, she jumped, landing with a thud and a whimper. The firemen hurried to connect their hoses in advance into the searing heat, but experience told them it was too late to save the building or anyone trapped in it. It was an explosive fire, probably started from kerosene or some other flammable substance. From the ground floor, a woman and a man came stumbling out as walking torches. Paramedics ran to cover them with blankets, smothering the flames, trying to com comfort them and gently help them into the ambulances. No, I can't go, screamed the woman, her face charred and streaked with tears. My baby is in there. I've got to get her out. But by then, their apartment looked like the inside of a furnace. Sadly, a young medic shook his head and firmly urged her toward the ambulance. It was almost morning before they found the remains of the little baby in the still smoking ruin. But before they found her, the authorities had learned the horrible truth about the cause of the fire. A man, angry because someone would not repay him $8, had shot a flare gun into the building through a window, igniting some flammable substance.
A building was burned to the ground, 48 people were homeless, seven people were hospitalized, and a baby had died, all because of an argument over $8. Why does money hold such power over men? What does God think of money? Does he see it as a necessary evil? Didn't Jesus put God and money in opposite corners when he told us you cannot serve both God and money? Money is not evil, though the love of money is. Paul said the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's in 1 Timothy 6.10. There's nothing wrong with money in and of itself, but because of the sin in men's heart, the love of money can lead to pain and bondage, even for Christians. Money is like a chameleon. It takes on the color of its owner's heart. There is such a thing as contaminated money or blood money. Even the chief priests understood this, refusing to put Judas's money back into the treasury. However, money itself is not evil. It's just paper stained with ink. Money and God are not on opposite sides either. In fact, God uses money as a practical tool for many things. He uses money or the lack of it to test us, to see what is in our hearts. How we use our money is, is a gauge of where our priorities are. When a person wins a state lottery, one of the first questions reporters ask him is, what are you going to do with the money? What we don't realize is God asks us the same question over every dollar put into our hands. What do we do with it? And what we do with it shows our character. If we are faithful with our money, Jesus says we will be entrusted with spiritual riches as well in Luke 16, 11. God also uses money to teach us to trust him. Remember how Elijah was led by the Lord to a brook where he hid out for some time during a severe famine? No doubt he quickly settled into a routine. He knew about when to expect the ravens with his breakfast and dinner each day. He sat by the cool stream in the shade of its bank, and then slowly but definitely his brook dried up. God didn't allow him to be comfortable trusting in that brook, even though it had been God's provision for him. He was ready to lead Elijah somewhere else, so he caused Elijah's brook to run dry. When our financial brook runs dry, we are ready to listen to the Lord, who wants our, willf who wants our willful dependence on him. His only aim is to teach us and bring us closer to him. We so easily move into a greater degree of independence than God sees best. We need to realize that the lack of money is just as definitely from God as the provision of money. Recently, while I was on a trip to some developing nations, our personal brook seemed to dry up for a while. Darlene was home in Hawaii and it hadn't occurred to her how sparse our financial flow had become. Then one day there was no money in the bank. There was nothing in any purse. And yet she had planned to go out to eat with some friends. She ended up scrambling through every drawer in the house looking for stray coins. Not many, just a neat, enough to at least pay her own way at the restaurant. The Lord had my attention, Dar told me later. So I asked him why we had no money. And as Dar quieted her heart and listened, the Lord said, It's been some time since you were trusting me for small daily needs like toothpaste. Thousands of young people in YWAM are going through this every day. I wanted to remind you that your needs and theirs are being met by me. I've heard of other people's brooks drying up, some much more drastically than in this temporary situation of ours. One man poured out his heart, telling how he and his wife had shared the needs of their ministry and churches for one year and yet not had, had not received a single commitment of support. Not one dollar. I thought I could discern some of the reasons for this, but it was for him to press in and get understanding from God. However, I did know one thing. Such a dramatic lack was a miracle too. It was as much a miracle as a sudden abundant release of finance. For such a winsome, honorable couple to share their need for one year and not have one person or church give anything to them, that was miraculous. When the brook dries up, we need to ask God how to move on like Elijah did. Because money is important in our lives, God word, God's word devotes much space to it. In fact, there are 3,225 references to financial matters in the Bible. We don't have to wonder what God thinks about money and its use when we search the scriptures. In a later chapter, we will see what the Bible has to say about some of these important areas. With these foundations, we can go on to do whatever God leads us to do in complete freedom. Many get-rich plans promise financial freedom. God promises financial freedom too, but his freedom is quite different from the empty promises of brokers and salesmen. He promises that we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. And that includes learning the truth about money. We can be truly free. But first, we need to learn some things about our adversary and money. God isn't the only one concerned about money. Our enemy, Satan, also has great involvement in finances, acting both on a big international scale and personally against us as individuals. And that is the end of chapter four.